Good morning, everyone. I'm Fiona MacDonald, Policy Director with the Australia Institute Centre for Future Work. Welcome to our webinar series, which um, I'm hosting yeah. today. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what that noise was, I hope. Yeah, I'm, I'm hosting today's uh, webinar, standing in for our Deputy Director, Ebony Bennett, who's unwell today. We wish her a speedy recovery. Um, I'm really pleased to be here um, to, to host this webinar to discuss with Micheline Lee her recent quarterly essay. Before I introduce Micheline, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land um, from which uh, I am coming today, which is Nam, Melbourne, and the traditional owners are the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nations. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge traditional owners all around the nation and especially the traditional owners um, in the uh, in Canberra where the Australia Institute and all my colleagues are based, uh, the Ngunnawal people. Uh, thank you for coming along today. Um, our format is uh, we will have um, half an hour of um, conversation between Micheline and I, and that will be followed by um, a Q&A. And you are welcome to um, please put your questions um, through the Q&A function, which is that should be at the bottom of your screens. Now, I'm delighted to um, be speaking with Micheline today. Um, she has um, she is a, an amazing person who I have only recently met, but um, who has um, written this fabulous quarterly essay, which I commend to you all. Uh, it's um, Lifeboat, Disability, Humanity and the NDIS. And um, as someone um, who has followed the NDIS and its development over time and the ways in which um, it has, it has, as you know, as a, as an observer and as a researcher from a distance, the ways in which it has attempted to change the change the way we as a society support and include people with disability. Um, I was just so um, delighted to read this um, essay, which I think is a must read for everybody. Micheline has done an amazing job of, of putting together her personal story with a very insightful analysis of recent policy developments. Micheline was well equipped to write this. She is an author um, and um, she has won an award uh, or she's shortlisted. Um, her, her piece, The Healing Party, was shortlisted for several awards, including the Victorian Premier's Literary Award. So um, she is an accomplished writer. Born in Malaysia, um, Micheline migrated to Australia um, as a child and has lived with motor neuron disability from birth. She is a former human rights lawyer and she's also a painter, so she's an enormously accomplished person. Her fourth, her, this essay um, is a powerful and moving. The, the story she tells of the NDIS um, as a scheme for transformative social change that has run into problems uh, really as I said, it just it gets to the heart of some of the um, of some of the ways in which the NDIS has come adrift um, and has actually meant more exclusion for some people. So um, I won't delay any more. I'd like to um, start this conversation with Micheline and give her a chance to speak. <laughs> Uh, and please do, as I said, um, put your questions in the Q&A. So, Micheline, welcome and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for your generous welcome, Fiona. It's great to be with the Australian Institute. Thank you. It's great to have you. So in your essay, you describe um, both your personal journey and, and the policy story. And your personal journey, you describe so beautifully um, as, as how you as a teenager and young adult um, came from seeing disability as something to overcome up to developing an understanding of um, disability as being human. And uh, would you like, could you talk to me a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so 
Um, there were five kids in my family and three of us had the motor neuron um, disability and um, use electric wheelchairs. And um, as um, a symptom of the motor neuron disability that we have is a progressive loss of function um, and, uh, um, and shorter lifespan as well. Um, and we were born in Malaysia. Um, and when we were born, my parents um, saw it as the result of an ancestral curse. Um, and then when we migrated to Australia, when I was eight years old, my parents became born again. And um, then they saw our disability as um, um, a sign of, of the devil. And so um, we went to a lot of um, fundamentalist meetings and they tried to heal us. There were lots of exorcisms. So I, I had um, this background as well as, you know, in Australian um, society, just seeing that, that um, disability was something that was um, devalued out of the normal, um, seen as a deficit. And so I really picked up on all these attitudes. Um, and so um, when I experienced that I couldn't be cured or healed, then I saw disability as something that had to be overcome. So I tried my best to conform, to ignore my own needs. Um, I would miss out on classes that were upstairs at school, but not speak out. Um, I would get pressure sores from sitting in the same position all day at work rather than ask anyone for help. I'd use the um, toilet in the shopping center down the road um, because it had a disability access toilet there rather than um, speak up about needing a disability access toilet at my workplace. So, and having a disability then seemed um, unacceptable to me, especially when I was younger, I thought it would be the end of the world when I became so weak that I couldn't look after myself. Um, but paradoxically, the weaker I became, the more accepting I became because I could see that it wasn't at all the disaster I was fearing. You know, you just adapt and the things that matter in life, in relationships, sunsets, the, the sea, um, great stories, good food, they're all still there. Um, and I guess I realized how damaging to the fear of vulnerability is. Um, when my son was about um, seven years old, I um, went to pick him up from school and I have a belt that keeps me in my wheelchair, but it had fallen off and then it got stuck on my wheel so that, and I was zooming along. And um, when the wheel, when the belt got stuck in the wheel, um, it jammed and spun the chair around and I and I fell out um, and so there I was lying on the ground and um, and suddenly my son was nowhere to be seen um, and he had actually moved right away from me and then there were parents and there were teachers and kids um, all surrounding me and I was just um, sort of twisted on the ground and um, we had to get somebody to help me up and um, then um, when I was back on my chair um, and, um, and um, left the school premise, then there was my son waiting for me and I was absolutely livid. I, was, I said to him, um, why weren't you there? Why weren't you there for me, to help me? And he, um, and he was very upset and he just said he didn't know. And I just realized that it was about my own shame um, and the way I had brought him up or the way I was in front of him, not, not showing my own vulnerability. And so he was uncomfortable about um, seeing me in that situation. And that really made me want to change um, and be you know, who I was. And so that gives him the freedom to be who he is as well and um, yeah. So, and I've come to see just how narrow and unrealistic our conception of humanity is. 
like society caters for such a narrow conception of able bodiedness you know we've adopted a notion that the norm is a person who's independent and a non and autonomous that's a myth of course we're all dependent all vulnerable everyone has struggles you know we're dependent when we're born and um, usually when we die you know we have injuries we have mental health days that's the reality of our situation and within disability itself there's such a huge range and sometimes people can only see the physical disability and it's perhaps people with cognitive impairments who are severe cognitive impairments who are dehumanized the most. You know, I think about, um, you know, just examples like I have um, a neighbor who said she was the um, eldest grandchild and then she said, oh, but maybe, oh, but actually um, there is another older grandchild, but she doesn't really count because she has um, an intellectual disability. Or I have a friend who works in a group home for people with severe intellectual disabilities. And when I spoke with her about what the conditions were like there, um, her, her response was, they eat better than me. They're fine, you know, rather than actually think about the broader aspects of life. Um, yeah, so it, and this concept of vulnerability, it's not just, um, you know, a principle, I see it, play out in the way um, that policies are actually made and, and in people's attitudes because of that fear of vulnerability um, there is this sort of overlooking um, of um, the reality of the situation and what people with disabilities really need and that we're part of the society and it's important to acknowledge you know who we are and stop acting like society is only for the able-bodied, independent, autonomous being. And it's actually normal for society to cater for all. Mm, thanks. That's um, you've that's an um, amazing journey that you've had to go through. And I think you're asking for everyone else to go through it too, to understand how society um, does place so much emphasis on being strong and denies weakness. Yes. It's, um, and it's you can see that it's embedded in in embedded, embedded across society in so many ways and what it means for people um, yeah. the denial of vulnerability is a massive thing particularly for people with don't in excluding people with disability I know um, you've talked about the social model of disability and and I you know I know a bit about it and it's it as a force in redefining disability um, it was adopted by the disability rights movement and it's been very powerful for people with disability and others in, in coming to a different understanding about disability. Could you talk a little bit about that and what you see as its strengths and weaknesses of that model? Yeah. Uh, the social model is a direct challenge to the medical or individual model. So the medical or individual model sees our impairments um, as the problem um, and it's a problem that needs to be fixed by um, medical cures or therapy um, and it's a very individual model um, that doesn't see um, the collective responsibility and that you know and that it's part of life um, and so it defines um, and the social model is very, um, it's powerful in its simplicity. Um, it demonstrates that the problems people with disabilities face are the result of exclusion and social and environmental barriers such as discriminatory attitudes and policies, inaccessible buildings and transport, you know, inflexible work arrangements, systems that don't cater for neurodiversity, um, and that they're not individual deficits. So the disadvantage we um, experience, so that they actually use the word in, impairment in UK, they do, but in Australia we don't, but they, um, 
the impairment is your actual condition. The disability, the actual disadvantage is caused by, by society. And um, the importance of, of seeing that, um, that dichotomy um, is that it places the moral responsibility on society to remove the disadvantage and the burdens which have been imposed on disabled people and to enable them to participate. Um, and as I said, it's um, the social model is, is, is simple and therefore it's a powerful transformative tool, but it doesn't tell the whole story because it doesn't acknowledge that while impairment can be a source of pride, um, creativity, um, it can also cause pain um, and severe limitation. So in fact, we're disabled by society as well as, as by our bodies. Um, which leads me to the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, which I've just called the CRPD. Um, the CRPD adopted the social model of disability. Um, it, people with disabilities were um, heavily involved in the development of the CRPD and um, it's, and um, and that's reflected in the CRPD also adopting the social model of, of disability, but it actually fleshes it out. It recognizes that social barriers need to come down, but we also need care and supports um, to live independently. So the CRPD sees disability as the social model does, not just as an individual issue, but a universal one and policies should express this universality rather than cater only for people with a narrow range of ability. And um, the important thing about the CRPD, and it's our latest um, UN, disability, um, UN rights convention, is that um, it really looks at how can you actually exercise your rights? It's not enough to just have rights you need to be able to exercise them. And so it, it sets up states' responsibilities to make society more accessible and provide the individual supports to ensure that people with disabilities can exercise rights on an equal basis with others. It really spells out what these responsibilities are and kind of gives us a roadmap. And it also makes clear we need to adapt to the realities of specific groups vulnerable to discrimination. So it doesn't just cater for, you know, um, the people who are most well-known as disabilities, you know, the, the mobility disabilities. Um, it really does look at, at people with, with higher needs, people with severe cognitive impairments as well. That's uh, a very um, a good point perhaps to take us to um, Australia's um, <clears throat> response, well, not as an entire response, but a very, very important, massive response to um, its meeting its responsibilities under the um, convention, and that's the NDIS. Uh, it's hard to know kind of where to start <laughs> to talk about the NDIS, um, as everybody probably who's here today is aware. It, it um, the NDIS has had some incredibly um, important, um, it, it's been most significant in changing for, for the better, um, people's opportunities and lives, but it's also fraught with some um, really big problems um, in its implementation. So perhaps if we start with what, 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 what's, what was the, um, this massive policy policy shift, which was towards the goal of equality for people with disability, how did the vision that was articulated for the NDIS to respond to what the disability rights movement was calling for, and to um, the responsibilities that uh, to meeting the responsibilities that we have under the convention? So, what did it aim to do? What what was its vision? Okay, so um, it aimed to assist people to participate in, uh, people with disabilities to participate in society 
and um, to um, stop the levels of, of segregation and people being um, shut out of employment, um, education. You know, we have a very low rate of, of participation, um, people with disabilities in Australia. And, um, and although Australia is one of the um, most wealthy countries in the world, the relative rate of poverty for people with disabilities um, is um, one of the highest. Um, and so our response to um, disability um, in the past was mainly our discrimination laws. And it was recognized that that's a very, very individual focused thing that, that works better for people who are already able to participate so, you know, if you're discriminated against in, in your, your job or um, in your, um, um, in participating in a club or something like that, and there's an individual that you can identify as having discriminated, um, then there's something you can do about it um, under our disability discrimination laws. But, but a lot of discrimination actually flows from the structures in our society, um, like um, you know the systems and infrastructures of inaccessible buildings and transport, the way um, for cognitive um, people with cognitive impairments, so much of your ability to participate depends on being able to contract um, and. So, and we did. Did, did, the, did the NDIS tackle those issues, those structural issues? Did it intend to? Was it intended to? It was intended to. Um, yes. So, we've had, um, so it was intended to actually provide the supports, provide individual supports so that a person is, um, has their personal care, the equipment, the therapies that they need, but it also was acknowledged that in order to participate, um, you need to have um, the social and um, environmental barriers in society removed. Um, and so people, the system that, uh, um, that existed before the NDIS, we did have some um, state disability supports. We had a system of state disability supports, but they were ad hoc and underfunded, and they certainly um, weren't seen as in an entitlement. Um, there was an arbitrary budget allocated, and um, if the budget wasn't um, enough, then people were just on, on waiting lists. I remember when I needed disability supports, I was told um, I would need to wait until somebody died um, before um, I could get a spot. Um, and has, the, has the NDIS made a big difference for you personally? Um, yes, um, it has. Um, so I, um, I guess before I talk about what it meant for me personally, um, yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about more broadly what, what changes it's mm -hmm. made. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so the goals were that, that the NDIS would um, operate as an entitlement and that we would get adequate disability supports, um, personal care, equipment, therapies, et cetera, and that there would be choice and control because um, we still live in, in a society where people didn't have any self-determination um, about um, where they live, with whom there are people with um, young people who have to be in nursing homes um, because of their high needs and not being able to find anywhere else where they could um, have those needs accommodated. And um, and we wanted participation. So we wanted more than just um, individual supports, more than just um, 
having our you know survival and basic needs and daily needs met we wanted um, the supports to be able to actually translate into community involvement and so and so the NDIS in its goals in the legislation actually did recognize um, what we were asking for. And in many ways, the NDIS is one of the most progressive schemes there are internationally. Um, and it was about, so it was set up so that um, it's, it's designed to meet people's needs. The scheme is uncapped, it's not based on an arbitrary budget um, and choice and control is a very, very important um, aspect of the NDIS. Um, and um, the way that they chose to do that was through individual funding. So in the past we had block funding and block funding is funding that goes to the support providers who then would make determinations about um, how people, how to distribute um, this, their services, um, which meant that you might have a service provider who um, um, you know, doesn't give you as much freedom as you want to, you can't um, you have to shower, you know, once every three days rather than every day. Or, um, mm. yeah, if you wanted to um, cross-dress, the service provider might not do that. Um, mm. And, yeah, so... I just, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm, I'm aware we're going to run out of time. Yeah. And there's so much I'd really like to ask you. Uh, so the NDIS implemented that. Um, the mechanism for choice and control yes. was individualised funding and the really significant problem, it seems to me, in the, in the implementation of the NDIS has been the reliance on a competitive market. Yeah, uh, yes. And as well as perhaps a framing of NDIS participants as consumers. Yeah in an attempt to uh, enable people to exercise their human rights, um, this seems to have been a reduction to an understanding of them, understanding that as exercising your right as a consumer in a market. Um, how, you know, could you talk a bit about how you see um, what are the main things that have um, gone wrong in the implementation? Yeah, so... In the implementation, um, there was, um, um, so in the implementation, in order to continue having, you know, support, the emphasis was was put on cost savings um, and, um, and we use things like the language of investment where um, short-term investment would yield long-term benefits that, um, the scheme would be justified by greater productivity and employment and less healthcare costs. And a market scheme was set up, as, as you said, um, and, and that was attractive to government, um, although there's a whole raft of evidence about why market approaches fail when it comes to a lot of um, services, but especially um, where it's complex and there's a, a great diversity of needs and care. Um, but um, that was also part of the, um, you know, devolution, the, the um, perception that it would be cheaper um, and that it would be in, attractive to the private sector and that it would empower people as consumers and the market would grow to meet needs and innovate um, but of course, that's not what happened. Um, so people um, who haven't been able to take that um, role of idealised consumer and translate their funds into services um, have been greatly disadvantaged, you know, and there's been thin markets. People, um, our First Nations people um, haven't, 
been able to have services within the community. It's, it's meant more of um, having to actually leave their, their, um, their country and, um, and actually go and stay in the bigger towns in order to receive services. And there's also just been a, a lack of accountability um, and, um, and um, yeah, so just going to your question about what the NDIS has meant for me personally. Um, so it's, I mean, the NDIS is an entitlement now, and that's a great thing, um, but um, it, um, but now, but of course it, it's, it's not, although it's an entitlement, it's not one that everybody can use and that's what needs to be addressed. Um, and so you have some people who say that NDIS has been life-changing and others um, who haven't been able to use it and others who've actually be, been harmed by the lack of care in this market approach. Um, and for me, um, it's still about, fitting into a system. I mean, I've benefited a, a lot from actually having some funds to employ support workers and um, which means I can live at home. I don't have to go into a group home as, as my needs, um, my needs become higher. Um, yeah, so, but the problems are that some have benefited, but it's, um, it's very inequitable um, and um, only, this only provides more choice and control for the few people who can manage the market model, those who are seen as, basically it, it seems to be the market who chooses, people who are seen as, as difficult, um, where profits won't flow, um, people um, who have very specialised needs may not be getting the services. So, in relation to specialised needs, um, I have found that I can't get anybody to um, modify um, a scooter I have, which is um, a very important piece of equipment for me, but which is about 20 years old now. And um, because it is so specialised and there's not enough profit in it, I can't actually find any provider who will repair it for me. Um, and yeah, and we're still fitting into um, society's conceptions of um, who we should be rather than who we actually are. So, for instance, um, when um, at my planning meeting where they decide what funds you get, yeah. the, this is an insurance scheme. And so um, your funding has um, and fund, an insurance scheme is about short term investment and and um, and long term um, savings, and so you should be getting um, less for this plan, just based on these insurance principles. But I said that, um, but my situation actually is degenerative. But the planner I had couldn't see past that. Um, and there's been there have been very many stories um, related to that inadequacy in planning. I think that's possibly yes. not a not an uncommon experience. Look, thank you so much for um, your preparedness, and it's uh, it's a very powerful um, thing in your essay too. You're combining your personal experience with your and your reflections um, on. Uh, disability in our society and the way that we regard it as, as well as the NDIS. I'm going to have, it's time for us to go to the Q&A. We've got quite a few questions from people. Um, so I don't, I do want to give, give us, uh, give them a bit of a chance to get some of them answered. And one that strikes me as um, just related to what you were just saying um, is a question from um, Adam who said, asked, as someone who both works in the NDIS space and who lives with autism, it can be difficult, difficult to explain that while some things that others take for granted are harder for me, it doesn't mean I'm disabled. How do you deal with these kinds of difficult and often confronting questions in your work? And I see that as a good question that goes to your reflections about how you, you yourself view 
disability. Could you, what would you say to Adam? Um, I'm wondering if, if Adam is, is referring to people's um, expectations of, um, of a person being disabled. Um, and when he says he, he doesn't feel like he's disabled because you know, of the attitude. So there's always that thing of, of, you know, you want to identify that you've got a disability so that your needs are met. But then if you do identify as being disabled, then then, then can often be um, stigmas attached and people's expectations of you get lowered and, and they don't give you all the opportunities that, at, at work that they might give to someone um, else because, um, because of, of this sort of unconscious um, bias. Uh, yes, and, and I would just say that, that, you know, it would be great if we did actually just see every, you know, going back to that whole notion of, of vulnerability where, where we can actually get away from that medical approach um, and see it just in, in um, terms of, of people's needs um, and functioning and a society that um, actually governs for all. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That's um. Yeah. I was trying to. I think you. It's it's about what you were saying before. It's um. It's about uh. We've got a long way to go, um. To actually make those shifts. Going to a couple of people have asked a question on how the NDIS might be improved, and um. That relates to I think to what you're just talking about what 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 could we expect from the NDIS in terms of getting us closer to using the NDIS to get us closer to the to the kind of vision that it was established to meet yeah so there are um some um you know very practical steps that need to be made like there needs to be more market stewardship um, and there needs to be much more accountability um, and there needs to be um, more safeguards and um, an acknowledgement that not one size fits all and um, there needs to be services outside of the NDIS available within the broader community as well, um, we've seen those depleted. So there are all these things that I know that the, um, the NDIS um, reform committee will be um, looking at and those recommendations will come out um, in a couple of weeks. Um, and what I'm hoping is that they are underpinned by human rights, um, that human rights has to be front and center. And I'll just give you an example because the NDIS has taken this very um, narrow conception of choice and control. So, um, like, they've, it's like you either you either have capacity or you don't have capacity. They haven't seen, you know, all the greys in between, um, and also that everyone's capacity should be respected by actually providing that support in order to, um, to exercise um, that capacity. So, you know, the classic case is the very um, distressing situation of Anne-Marie Smith, where um, she was treated as though um, she had the capacity um, without extra supports you know, just um, to, to manage her supports. And um, so she, Anne-Marie was um, a woman with cerebral palsy in Adelaide um, who um, was living with her parents. Um, and during that time, um, she had a very, uh, a pretty good life in, um, she's, loved her pets, had friends. Uh, when her parents died, she, um, the state system 
changed over to the NDIS. And there was instructions that she needed to um, have face-to-face -face, um, meeting with someone from the NDIS and that she would have difficulties understanding um, some of the concepts and needed to also have a friend there. None of that happened and she just got a phone call and um, as it ended up, there was just one disability support worker providing assistance um, to Anne-Marie and there was no um, oversight at all. Um, and this support worker over a, a period of, of two years just neglected um, Anne-Marie um, until um, she was malnourished, left in the same chair, died from pressure sores. Um, and, um, and so it, the um, support worker is now in prison for criminal manslaughter. Um, the service provider um, has been fined, but you know, what, what about the NDIS and its responsibility to provide the level of care and accountability um, and I found it very disturbing when the then CEO of the NDIS said, well, the presumption is that a person, um, that an NDIS um, receiver um, has, um, um, has capacity. Um, but that presumption of capacity, that is a right that can only actually be exercised if you have the supports to exercise. Um, I think that's a very, very crucial point. You see that again and again and again, yes. the yeah. presumption of capacity can get in the way um, of proper evaluation <laughs> of yes. the support that's needed to exercise the capacity. And um, can we rely on a market to do that with safeguards, do you think? Um, I'm, I'm asking this question. It's reflecting some of the questions that are in the Q&A. I'm trying to kind of put them. There's quite a few. We're not going to get to answer them all. I'm trying to put some of these together in, in asking this question. Can we rely on a market even with this additional safeguards or does something need to sub shift substantially? And one of the questions um, that could relate to this is someone has said, would a human rights charter make a difference? Um, okay, so I, th I think a human rights charter would be great in terms of, I mean, in Victoria, we already have a human rights um, charter, um, but that um, is more in relation, um, yeah, at yeah, if, at a federal level, um, it would be great to have a human rights charter because we don't take into account um, enough how it has to underpin um, the pol all our policies. Um, and while we Australia has signed up to the CRPD, um, there needs to be more of a, a, a domestic um, implementation of that um, so it's not just seen as principle but something that we actually do have to follow um, and yes and as to the question about what um, whether it's enough um, to just change the market model um, it has we need a much more collective approach um, and it is about, you know, all those structural changes. Um, states have to come back in to providing um, supports outside of the NDIS um, and we need, we really need attitudinal change. Um, when you talk with people with disabilities, um, they'll always say, it all depends on the attitude of the planner. It all depends on the attitudes of the support workers. Um, it, these are the things that that really make make a difference. So we need that that cultural change as well. And the NDIS needs to lead 
that cultural change. Um, and with the market scheme, you know, it might mean, you know, things like introducing some block funding back, you know, making mm -hmm. sure that advocacy has, has mm -hmm. emphasis that support coordinators are actually better trained um, and that we have more intermediaries um, mm -hmm. and that and that the public's that the public service that government is actually the provider of last resort you know so that you don't have this hands-off um, approach the government has to be um, the provider provider of last resort the, and the body that makes sure that services are actually adequate and meeting people's needs and safe. Mm, that's um that's very um interesting to hear you say that as my research, I, I know you're aware my research comes from the perspective of workers in the NDIS and the absence of collective res responses and collective responsibility um, seems to me to be such a weakness. <laughs> of the system in terms of its its capacity to, to respond in an appropriate in, 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 and include um, and build. I've got a question um, from Tom that's um, uh, sort of goes to some of these issues. The NDIS currently, a review currently underway, gives us a chance to realign the system for better outcomes. Bruce Bonnerhady has indicated that the tier system needs to be dropped so that there is no cliff between those with disability getting a funding package and those with disability who don't get one. Wanting to see that difference flattened out. What do you think of that idea? Um, I think that's very important actually because at the moment we've just got this kind of precipice where people who are eligible for NDIS um, supports get these individual funding packages to buy the supports and then the people who um, may need um, but may ha need have a need for supports but um, don't quite meet the criteria for the NDIS um, were supposed to actually be able to continue sourcing the supports they need from mainstream um, organisations, so you're supposed to be able to um, still get your um, health and community services from local councils and um, schools were supposed to be able, was supposed to still um, provide the supports to um, neurodiverse students. Um, and but what we've seen is a big dropping off. So it's suddenly you've just got this cliff, the NDIS, and then then nothing. So that that is very important. It's also very important with, for the sustainability of the scheme, and it's also just important because um, we we don't want the NDIS to be a lifeboat. Um, we want our community to actually be inclusive um, and and open and safe. We don't want to. We don't want the NDIS to be something that is there to save the individual. You know, we want the community to be um, a safe place and inclusive place. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, a couple of people have asked a question about um, access to the NDIS um, by people who are over 65, who are ineligible. ineligible. Um, and one particular question that's um, in the Q&A today is uh, about whether you have any views on whether the class action by those over 65 um, is likely to have any chance of success. Uh, I didn't know there was a class action um, occurring actually. Um, and so I won't be able to comment on its um, um, likelihood of, of success, um, but I can see why um, people would be making that claim because it seems like quite an arbitrary cutoff. But if you look at the picture, I guess it, it is again about um, the mainstream and the other services needing to be stronger so that we're not all just dependent on the NDIS. And, you know, you wouldn't blame people for scrambling to be on the NDIS um, because, um, because, 
um, you know, it is a desert um, otherwise. Another question, I think we've heard a bit about, um, you know, this goes to some concerns uh, that many people um, who have been receiving support through the N NDIS have um, made, which is about this uh, person has suggested that it's perhaps their observation is that it's evolved into a system um, towards becoming a parallel independent clinical service but characterised by staff who are not qualified to make clinical decisions um, and really, you know, aren't able to make um, reasonable types of assessments um, lacking and it lacks independent oversight. So participants can actually be placed in a really vulnerable position um, with the example of when a, an NDIS provider is applying for a guardianship order arguing that this is necessary to manage someone when it appears the provider has neither the skill nor the patience to learn how to work with a participant. Um, and that's obviously a, a, an observation someone's made, but there are elements of that that potentially um, go to broader um, experiences. That wasn't a question so much as a comment, but I don't know if, you, if you'd like to, to comment on that. Uh, sorry, can you just um, um, repeat the question again? Sorry. Yeah, it wasn't really a question. It was a comment that there seems to that the system seems to evolved into one where um, uh, the, it's becoming a kind of parallel independent clinical service with assessments being made and decisions being made um, about people's needs um, and capacity by people who aren't really are uh, adequately qualified to do that and that it can be quite disturbing to see providers and others um, trying to manage participants and um, in ways who, when they don't actually really have the skill or the knowledge to do that. So it's about the lack of capacity in the system yeah. at yeah. the same time, I think, as the system, um, as we've seen, has incentives for providers to make decisions about what might be the best, you know, way for somebody to have their package delivered. Yeah, and I guess this goes also to the um, corruptive nature of a market system that um, yeah. people are, are going into the area um, looking because, you know, there are people with individual funding packages and um, and so there is this incentive to um, um, deliver more and more um, specialised services um, where it's not necessarily um, needed or, mm -hmm. um, or professional or um, adequately um, clinically tested. Um, and, um, and that's where we do need... Um, um, more regulations um, and um, and um, accountability coming in. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that is becoming so so apparent. It's been apparent to uh, many people with experience in the NDIS. I think um, uh, programs like those in the last in this this week have been on the ABC uh, Four Corners um, that have demonstrated that there's. A lack of a lack of appropriate oversight of um, of this market are uh, really showing that. Uh, another question um, that uh, attracted quite a bit of um, attention on the Q and A um, is the question about the NDIS being created for people with severe disabilities and the problem of people um, who may have a disability that stops them from participating in life in various ways, um, but who can't, um, that, you know, that people without a disability would, um, being able to do things that they would take for granted, uh, but not being eligible um, for the NDIS because um, their disability is not regarded as severe enough and a question about um, whether 
some kind of means testing would make a difference um, because of poverty being such a big hurdle for many people um, who don't who aren't able to access um, services. So people who still have a disability that's preventing them from doing many things, but they're not eligible because it's not regarded as severe, and yet they're in poverty because of um, of the problems that they're facing. Yeah. So um, some the NDIS has this um, eligibility, and unfortunately, it doesn't always operate fairly because of the onus that it puts on people to. Um, prove their their eligibility and you do find that people who um, have more supports are um, more um, able to um, understand bureaucracy and um, the language of the NDIS um, have um, ha are, are better able to um, to get the supports and and the NDIS shouldn't disadvantage people who um, because of um, you know not being able to pay for the specialist reports or whatever that you need and um, not having um, themselves the capability or through an advocate the capability of of making the case for the NDIS um, it yeah the it shouldn't that shouldn't be that that disadvantage there. Um, and um, the NDIS, um, they, I mean, there's the focus there that the NDIS is more about specialist supports, and that if you don't need the specialist supports, then those those other the other disability supports um, need to be available um, within the community. Um, and the question about mainstream. Um, Sorry, the question about what was the other question? Uh, it's about means testing. Means testing, yeah. Mm -hmm. So means testing um, is one of the things that I think the review will be looking at, but one of the reasons why it was rejected um, when the NDIS was introduced was because um, even for people who um, are employed and have jobs and are making um, a good income. Um, if you need a support worker um, and equipment, the the costs are ongoing and and very high, um, and um, and and can be quite quite debilitating. But but it is something that I understand the committee is looking at, um, and and that does lead to this issue about you know is is the NDIS um, affordable um, and, you know, it, and, you know, the language about NDIS being a financial burden and, and we want the NDIS to be value for money and financially sustainable. Um, and there are ways that we've already touched on that that can be improved, like the more accessible society is, the less need there is for individual supports. You know that reforms to the market will also assist making society more accessible. But the thing about um, the discussion about costs of disability supports um, is that if these aren't provided, it's not like the cost just um, disappears. It's disabled people who bear the costs. Yeah. On that point, I think we'll have to finish. I'm so sorry. We have run out of time, but I think that's a really important point to finish on. Um, we need to think about the broader costs. We need to think about the broader issues. Um, as you said, people with disability have an appalling labour market um, participation and employment rates. And that's not down to um, lack of lack of trying on the part of many people who want to be in, people with disability who want to be in the labour force. I can't thank you enough, Ms. Shalene, and I can't thank our audience today enough. I'm really sorry I didn't get to all the questions. Um, I really do encourage you to read Ms. Shalene's quarterly essay, which is, I think, in all um, good news agents at the moment. Um, it is really inspiring um, and tells us a lot about 
how far we need to, how far we've come, but how far we need to go. Um, so on your behalf, I'd like to thank um, Micheline uh, enormously for um, your contribution today. Thank you and, uh, and thank my colleagues for your support and um, our participants, uh, please do continue to take part in our Institute webinars. We really enjoy having your company. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, goodbye. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to keep up to date with all our latest research and work, sign up to our newsletter. Delivered every fortnight, it includes behind the scenes updates from Richard Dennis, an exclusive cartoon from Judy Horacek, details for our upcoming events and webinars, as well as explainers, graphs, and not to mention the latest cutting edge research and analysis from the team here on the key issues that are facing Australia. Click the button on your screen to check it out.